We're going to have a chance uh, here to see some great stories from farmers this morning, uh, most importantly live and the, as they come up on stage, but we've also got some videos that we're going to be showing you of some of their farming operations and their use of cover crops. What I'd like to do in the next few minutes is talk to you a little bit about the big picture with uh, why we're here for cover crops and soil health. Zero in just a bit, uh, looking at some of the questions that people have, such as do cover crops pay? So I'm going to give you a sneak peek of some of the national survey data that we're just getting ready to start releasing. We'll go into that in more detail tomorrow. But I want to start by pointing to this tagline, harvesting the potential. As you heard, that comes to us from the Howard G. Buffett Foundation, and I think it's an appropriate metaphor for a few aspects of this conference. The one I want to start with is an idea you're going to hear repeated, I think, a number of times today from some of the farmers and other people working in this area which is the idea that we have a free resource, an underutilized resource, namely sunlight, that we can be using to harvest the potential that we have in the fall and the spring. So this is a photo I took in, at the end of October on Steve Gross Farm in eastern Pennsylvania. Many of you uh, either know Steve personally or know of him. Steve has been a real leader in the cover crops effort nationally. I first visited Steve's farm almost 20 years ago, and he was using cover crops even then. But what struck me uh, with this field, you look at the sunlight, the photosynthates that are being gathered there, the living roots that are being built in the soil, that's a field of oilseed radish, uh, annual ryegrass, and crimson clover, a mix of covers. And think about what they're doing, and then compare that to this field. I took this shot right next to my parents' farm in central Illinois, near Decatur, Illinois, uh, at Thanksgiving year before last. This was a field of corn that had been uh, harvested early following the drought. They had bailed off all the stover because of the shortage of feed and uh, then chisel plowed twice, recreational tillage at its finest, I guess you could say. And uh, there's a less than 5% residue there. So no sunlight being gathered by plants, just going to waste. The soil is lying dormant. We're not building living roots in the soil. Obviously, this is not what we're looking for. You know, when we talk about change, whether it's in conservation or other areas, I think sometimes it's instructive to go back in history and say, what brought us to this point? What changes happened or triggering actions? And all of you know how Hugh Hammond Bennett was the founder of the Soil Conservation Service. One of my favorite quotes that he had is, out of the long list of nature's gifts to man, none is perhaps so utterly essential to human life as the soil. Great quote. You may have heard the story from watching Ken Burns' PBS special, The Dust Bowl, or in other ways, about the dust storm that descended on Washington, D.C. on March 21st, 1935. So this is one of those pivotal moments in history. And he was testifying, if you've heard this story, it's a great story, he was testifying before Congress about the need for the Soil Conservation Service. At the time, as I understand it, there was a small office of soil erosion at USDA with no funding, no staffing support. And he was trying to get Congress to move on this and fighting a real battle. And of course, in the mid-30s, we had big problems with erosion and other issues with our land across the country. And he knew from various newspaper reports that this big dust cloud was descending on Washington from the Great Plains in the Midwest. So he prolonged and drug out his testimony in a way that probably would never happen today. And finally, one of the senators remarked, you know, I think the sky is getting kind of dark. And he said, is that dust? And Hugh Hammond Bennett replied, well, yes, Senator, I think it is. And they went to the window, and he talked to them about, even there in Washington, D.C., how they were being impacted by what was happening in the Great Plains and the Midwest. And as I understand it, been in there, those senators agreed that, yes, we did need to take action and form the Soil Conservation Service, and more importantly, take action in conservation on our land. And we look back at pivotal moments in history like that and say, you know, those were really earth-shaking for the conservation movement. But I truly believe that this week, even though we won't have a dust cloud hopefully descending on us in Omaha, that we have another watershed movement to move conservation forward because of all of you. Tomorrow we're going to have a great chance and a lot of breakouts to gather your ideas, hopefully your brainstorms of ideas of what we need to do to move forward. And that's going to be really key for us as we're here in Omaha. My own personal story, as I mentioned, I grew up on a family farm in central Illinois. My dad used cover crops when I was a boy in the 1960s. He was using yellow sweet clover, kind of an older practice, overseeded into wheat. Let that grow all summer and fall, let it grow again the following spring, and then plow it under as a green manure. And my dad would talk about how for years later, 
he could see the benefits for the corn crop of that yellow sweet clover on the land. But unfortunately, that was also the era of the moldboard plow. This is pretty much the configuration we had at John Deere 4020 and a four bottom plow. I spent many hours running equipment like that as a teenager. And you know, that of course led to some issues with the soil still blowing. So even though we were 30 years past the time of Hugh Hammond Bennett, still some issues. Even today, we still, there's still happening some. This is a photo a few weeks ago of a trooper that was injured in a car accident near St. Louis because of dust blowing off an uncovered field. So although we've made tremendous progress in conservation, we know we have further yet to go. And it's not just wind erosion, it's water erosion. This is a photo from last summer in western Iowa, not far from here. A five inch rainfall event had washed a lot of the soil out of a field that was already growing with corn seedlings. You're gonna hear Ray Gasser in a minute on his video talk about how his farm in western Iowa has experienced this very same issue. And the, the no-till that he has been practicing for many years is no longer sufficient to control soil erosion with these more intense rainstorms. And that's why he's moving to cover crops. So we're gonna hear lots of stories like that about the changes that we need. This may be a little hard to see, but taking a bigger picture look, this is a satellite image of the Chesapeake Bay. Uh, if we look at it, uh, there is a thin brown strip coming from the top edge of your picture. That's the Susquehanna River coming down from Pennsylvania. And you can see all the sediment loading going into the Chesapeake Bay. The Chesapeake Bay goes all the way down to here. Uh, and this was in mid-September of 2011. Again, here's the Susquehanna River coming down from Pennsylvania. Now, I just mentioned Steve Groff. I know this wasn't coming from his farm because he's got it all covered in cover crops. And, but it may have been coming not only from farms and construction sites, obviously lots of issues could have contributed. The bottom line is that the sediment loading can be immense and we've got the potential by putting green covers out there to help with that. Now we have made, as I said, tremendous progress in conservation since the days of Hugh Hammond Bennett. You've all seen those practices. Many of you have used them or contributed to them. It's simple things like grass waterways, no-till, erosion terraces, many other practices. But just imagine if we take the next step and go from these green grassed waterways to having all the land covered in green, capturing that sunlight. That's the potential that we want to work towards in conservation. So when I look at a field of this, like this annual ryegrass I took this fall in Missouri in late October, you know, I think there's just so much we can do to build that health of our soil through the use of cover crops and other practices. One personal story I can tell, I, I have a chance with my job to travel all over the Midwest to see a lot of things going on with farms and practices. And I was visiting a farmer named Jeff Rashaweir who had received a SARE grant. SARE is kind of an unusual program that we also, besides giving grants to universities, we also directly fund farmers to try things on their farms. And many times that's been cover crops. And Jeff had tried cover crops and he said, when you're driving to my farm, make sure you stop at this lake, Grand Lake St. Mary's. And I read a little bit about it before I got there. I found there were some, some issues and problems that were happening with the lake. So I took this photo when I parked and I thought, well, that doesn't look too bad. It's a 20 square mile lake, pretty good sized lake. But that doesn't look too bad. I'm not sure what all the fuss is about. And then I got right up to the water and I could see what all the fuss was about. Obviously severe algal blooms uh, coming from phosphorus as I understand it uh, happening in that water. Now Jeff was being worked with uh, by Jim Horman, I believe is here at the conference from Ohio State to implement cover crops. Jeff had been a very conventional row crop farmer. So he implemented cover crops, went to no-till, made a number of other management changes and he feels very good about what he's been able to do with those management changes on the land. But we know it's not just our lakes, whether it's Lake Erie or a smaller lake, it's also our rivers. And we've got uh, issues you may have seen like last summer, uh, not too far away here in Des Moines, where the water for drinking water had to be treated to remove the nitrates. And there were reasons that happened, such as the drought of 2012 and severe rain this spring. But we really do have an opportunity at this point in time, I believe, to move conservation forward with greater adoption of cover crops. We're gonna have a lot of people talking about how they're making that happen, but more importantly, I think collectively, all of us here, through the conversations we have here and following this conference and the partnerships we build, can make a tremendous difference in moving forward in this area. I'd like to switch gears and kind of zero in. I know all of you feel there's opportunities in this area, but we also know there are people that have questions. We might call them skeptics or at least just have questions about whether this can work on their farm or with the clients they work with. And one of the first ones we hear is, can cover crops pay? So this is where I want to give you a sneak peek at some data I'm going to go into more depth on tomorrow in terms of our national cover crop survey 
We've got some data from a year ago, many of you have seen, but also new data that's just hot off the presses. So I'm going to show you some results from the National SARE Conservation Technology Information Center survey. And again, we'll get into this in more depth tomorrow. The first slide is one you may have seen before or at least heard about, which is that we look, ask farmers about their experiences with corn on the left and soybeans on the right, with cover, which is blue, the blue bar, and without cover, which is the red bar. And in 2012, obviously a severe drought year, we saw about an 11 bushel increase in corn following cover crops. Now this is about 200 farmers. We had 750 that were surveyed, but we said if you've got a situation where you have similar soils, similar varieties, similar planting dates, what's the comparison in the yield? And they, maybe this happened because they had different landlords or other issues. So for soybeans, it was about a five bushel difference, so about 10 bushel uh, increase for both of those. And again, we'll look more at this data tomorrow. Let's jump to 2013, a much different weather year. The corn yields are quite a bit higher because of better weather for most of the corn belt. Here we have an eight bushel difference, the blue bar with covers, the red bar without. So an eight bushel advantage to cover crops. And this is about 500 farmers that had that comparison with similar management side by side. Soybeans, it's about 5% as well, uh, advantage to cover crops with soybeans. So again, we'll look more at this, including the state by state data tomorrow. So just a quick summary, I think we can say, based on that two years of survey data with several hundred farmers in many different states, that cover crops boosted corn and soybean yields for those two years by five to 10%, with the 10% being during the drought year of 2012. And you know, a couple years ago, we did not have this large scale data to really understand what the yield benefits would be. We've got a lot of smaller research replicated trials that give us some insights, certainly a lot of farmer anecdotal information, but I think this is very valuable. So let's take this a step further in the question of do cover crops pay? I want to take just a few minutes to hit this and then we'll move on. First of all, the cover crop cost. We also surveyed farmers on their seed cost and we found that they were paying a median cost of 20 to $30 an acre. That shouldn't be a surprise to most of you with a national median average of $25 per acre. They were also paying about 10 to $12 to uh, seed that cover crop either with their own labor and equipment or to hire somebody to do it. So that worked out to a median national average of $37 per acre to buy the seed and to get it planted. Now we know some farmers have to take a separate action to control that cover crop, uh, maybe tillage, but often they're spraying anyway for a burn down for winter annual weeds. So depending on whether there's a separate action needed, there may be another 10 or $12 an acre. So up to 50, but a median average of 37 if it's a winter kill cover crop or already a burn down being applied. All right, let's look back at the yield. If we take that lower figure of 5% yield increase, we're gonna take the national average corn yield of uh, 159 bushels an acre and the cash price for corn as of Friday in Marshall, Missouri, central Missouri, we get a net return of $35 an acre for corn based on that 5% increase, which I think is uh, something we can look to based on a large number of farms. $28 for soybeans likewise. So close to covering the cost of seed and seeding but maybe not enough to motivate somebody who's kind of on the fence about cover crops. Uh, so the question is, is this all we can expect, just the yield, or are there other things? Well, as you'll hear the farmers talking about, there certainly are other returns we get from the cover crops, and they're gonna do a better job of talking about that than me. I just wanna hit the highlights. Certainly we may have a nitrogen credit that can be up to $30 an acre or more, depending on whether legumes are used, the timing of nitrogen fertilization, and so on. Or it may be zero, just depending on the situation. We may have a return in terms of weed and pest management. You'll hear some of the farmers this morning talk about how they've been able to reduce one or two trips over the field with an herbicide or a pesticide. And so there can be a savings there that can accrue. We can also, in many cases, graze these cover crops. That seems to be an increasingly popular option with cover crops. And I've heard many people say this is one of the fastest ways to make them pay. So this is based on some figures, a growth rate of about a pound and a half of gain per day grazing on winter wheat or winter rye uh, from Rob Kallenbach at uh, University of Missouri. And it kind of depends on your stocking rate, what you assume and how long they're grazed, but this would be a conservative number on the return from grazing. So this question of do cover crops pay, I think we can say in the short run, yes, on most farms they are gonna pay even in that first year or two of growth, but especially with longer term growth. And let's talk about that longer term just for a moment, because this is what you're really gonna hear from the farmers this morning. 
they're going to talk to you about how they've built their organic matter. And we know that can provide many benefits for us, including helping with nutrients in the long term, uh, regenerating nutrients in the soil, soil moisture, as I said, during drought, and even land value. I think you'll hear Clay Mitchell talk about that. We can get reduced soil compaction. Some of our no-till farmers, I'm sure, will be talking to you about how they've seen benefits in that regard. Obviously, improved soil health, one of our big focuses for the conference, is something we're looking for that can help the resiliency of our cropping systems. If we don't have that soil eroding and erosion gullies and ripples, we can get in there and seed more easily and get better stands of our cash crops. And then one of the most interesting things to me is you'll hear many of the long-term users of cover crops say they did not just add cover crops to their operation, but they changed other aspects of their management. Maybe they moved to no-till, or maybe they added grazing with livestock. But there are other things that happen that improve their overall net profitability when we talk about cover crops coming into the system. Those are the on-farm returns. We know there are many off-farm returns. That'll be hit in one of our breakouts this afternoon. I'm not going to take a lot of time to go through this, but you saw the sediment in the Chesapeake Bay. That's a cost to taxpayers if we have to go out and dredge. If we have pesticides moving or nutrient loading, those are things that cover crops and other conservation practices certainly can help with that reduce the cost to taxpayers. So the question is, are they going to turn around and vote uh, through their members of Congress to provide incentives back and increase that opportunity? The other thing I touch on, and we'll hit this more tomorrow, is if cover crops can help during times of drought or weather extremes, that could, in fact, of course, reduce crop insurance payouts. We're obviously with the new farm bill moving from a system of paying for direct payments putting that money into crop insurance. So if we can cut that $5 billion in crop insurance subsidies by having lower payouts due to using cover crops, the question is, should there be an incentive or a reward for doing that? All right, I want to just wrap up and say, can we move farther and faster with adoption of cover crops? Let's look at what's happening so far. We think there's between two and three million acres out there. There's a lot of data to suggest that's about right. In fact, I think it's closer to three based on some recent information I've seen. The question you've heard is, can we get to 20 million acres of cover crops, and can we get there by 2020? That's the challenge that we're putting in front of you as a framing question for tomorrow's discussion. This is where we're at now. Uh, we're at about 367,000 with the 1,500 farmers surveyed, again, 3 million nationally. The key thing here is the growth rate. Over the last three years, this is over 1,500 farmers. Those 1,500 farmers, their growth rate in acreage on cover crops is about 31%. So can that be sustained? Well, I think if we look at new equipment innovation, new innovations in other areas that we'll be talking about in breakouts this afternoon, I believe that it can be. This is a new high clearance seeding equipment that's been developed for cover crops you'll see here at the exhibits. Here's a really novel piece. If you didn't see this yesterday, make sure you stop by this booth. This robot device that goes through the field, uh, a really neat invention uh, using GPS all on its own to seed cover crops, do fertilizer, other practices. So we need creative ideas like this to move forward. So can we get to 20 million acres of cover crops? Here's the numbers. At that 31% growth rate, if it continued, yes indeed, we would be to 20 million acres of cover crops by 2020. That may seem surprising being at about 3 million now, but that's the numbers they show us. Now we know we won't get there without some bumps in the road. We know there are going to be issues to overcome with seed supply, new variety adaption, and other challenges. But the bottom line is I think we can get there. So again, we're going to be looking tomorrow and even today to harvesting your good ideas as we move forward in making these conservation advances possible. And I think we hopefully will be able to look back in 10 years and say this was a watershed moment and moving forward farther and faster with conservation in the United States. So thank you. Thank you.